after this. So that's where you can connect with people. Yeah, that's true. We're going to do a little boothy thing. You can come to our booth afterward. Here's the skinny people. <laughs> Today, we're going to give 60 prospecting tips. Here's the gimmick, though. We're going to do the first 30 now, and we're going to do the next 30 at our booth. So if you get roped in here and you're like, man, I'm in I'm emotionally invested in this. Um, let's get rolling, I guess. Yeah, we're, gonna we're start, all good. You know, yeah. We don't have a lot of time, so we're going to kind of just Bye, fly Renee. through this. Goodbye, Renee. Uh, by the way, Renee's going to be like our angel. She'll be here. You think so? Darkness. All right. I'm going to hit play on this. Let's see if this works. I hope this doesn't just auto scroll. So I'm going to fly through these things really quick. Um, this is terrifying that we're using this. So this is 60 actionable prospecting tips, not tactics. I think they're more tips. I used the wrong word when I made the slides. You guys can judge me all you want. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My uh, name's Ryan O'Hara. I work at Lead IQ and VP of Marketing and Growth there. Uh, many moons ago, many, many years ago, I was the first business development rep at a company called Dine in Manchester, New Hampshire. They got bought by Oracle for like north of 600 million bucks a couple of years ago. Um, but when I was the first BDR, we grew and scaled the team. And I basically became the sales trainer there. So I taught Everyone that from rep three to rep 95 had a prospect and sell our services and stuff. What do you think of that, Rishi? How does that make you feel? It gives me some tickles in my tummy, but you forgot to mention who I am. Hi, I'm Rishi. I'm the sidekick. Yeah, Rishi's basically here to add commentary and make fun of me while I do this. So if you guys have questions or anything, I guarantee that we probably won't get to them, but we'll try to do what we can. Just ask questions that little blurb and Rishi can write them down and we'll answer them later on for you. Absolutely. And if you have any roast to give him, please let me know so I can roast him. Hey, hey, get out of here, Rishi. <laughs> get out of here. I don't even know how you got in on this talk. You're just writing on my coattails. All right, everyone, let's start really quick. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my prospecting experience, specifically with Lead IQ. This is some prospecting numbers that I have. If you actually look at the response rates, uh, over the course of four months of prospecting, I had a 48% reply rate and 84% open rate of my cold emails. This is measuring with sales loft, obviously. Um, one thing to note, I was very careful not to use stuff like replies to replies and stuff like that in my threads that I had. So uh, that's a part of this to show you that you could actually get double digit reply rates and do this stuff following some of these tips. So let's jump in. We're going to sweat through this. Uh, are there any comments or anything, Rishi, before we get started? Are people ready? Uh, nothing yet. All right, let's no roll. By the way, there will be a recording of this afterward. And uh, let's let's jump in. All right, <laughs> tactic number no, number one. When a prospect asks you to send more info, ask them what kind of info you think would be valuable to them. This one's actually pretty simple. All you're going to do is you want to figure out what ex exact info they have. A lot of the time they're doing a blow off. And if they're doing a blow off, that's a good question to ask. But like, all right, I can send you anything in the world. What specific info is valuable for you? If they don't answer that question, they're like, well, I'm not sure. Just send me an email or something. This is something you can do that. Uh, this is Sabrina from our marketing team. Hype your touches, hype your shit. So what you want to do is instead of saying, all right, I'm going to write you, I'll send you an email and just send a basic canned email with a bunch of info. Say, I'm going to send you the greatest email you've ever seen. It's going to be award-winning. It's going to be emotional. Like talk, say something different that makes it stand out a little bit. This will help you a ton with getting more response rates. It also makes them look for the email a little bit more. So that's why I'd say I'm going to send the greatest email ever. Tech, uh, tip number three, live up to the hype. So this is a picture of my mom. She thinks I'm obviously a huge disappointment. This is her apple picking a couple of years ago. Well, um, I mean, it's true. She makes the best potato pancakes. That's true, Rishi. I wish you hadn't been to my mother's house. It makes me uncomfortable. But that doesn't matter. Let's get back to this for a second. Point I'm getting at is you want to actually live up to the the the. If you're going to say I'm going to send a great email, or I'm going to do a great cold call, or send you a great LinkedIn message or connection request, you actually have to deliver on it. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do to do that. But the biggest thing is, as a rep, you want to show your individuality. If you're a manager, you want to get your rep to show themselves off. We're not cookie cutters. We're all different people and we need to spread our wings and fly a little bit. Tactic number four is to keep it real, homies. Don't do gimmicks. I see so many prospecting people that do terrible things that make me cringe. Uh, this is one that really kills me. I had a cold email that someone sent me and they had the word contract in it. And then they replied to the email with recontract for the follow-up. And all this does is piss off the prospect and make them not want to respond to you. So you want to be really careful to try not to do gimmicks and stuff. Try and sell with integrity and do things that are honest. Type number five, when you make your subject, when you're writing a cold email, you want to talk about it in the body. Whatever you talk about in your subject should be in the body of your email. So, so many people are like, what are all these secret subjects? I noticed this short phrase works really well. Throw those studies out, throw them in the trash. It doesn't matter. If you want to get good open rates on your emails, 
you want to bring up something that's vague, uh, vague enough to draw it and open. So these are what makes good subject lines. Good subject lines should be personalized and vague. That means that like, if I wrote you a cold email, Rishi, if people don't know Rishi does stand-up comedy outside of work, uh, I might say something like, hey, I might write your stand-up as a subject line. Now, if I say your stand-up in the subject line, I better talk about your stand-up in the body of an email. If I wrote something like, hey, Rishi, your kids are sick at, at school in the subject line, and then I don't bring up your kids being sick at school, I'm a jerk. You want to be honest, obviously, and you want to try and bring up whatever that thing is in your subject line. Keep it yeah. short and sweet. My kids are sick. That's right. That's right, Rishi. Um, I have to go. Oh, sorry about this, Ryan. I have to really go. <laughs> Good subjects also set the expectation of what your cold email's body is going to be about. So it's kind of simple. It's what the purpose of subject lines are used for in the first place. Make sure you deliver on that. <clears throat> Good subject lines should be more about uh, your prospect than you. So I know there's all this data out there that says, like, use your company name and their company name and stuff. That stuff's canned and you're missing an opportunity. The other thing to keep in mind is when you're looking at a subject line, uh, if it's vague enough, but it relates to something that's about them, they're going to be way more likely to hang on. A good, good subject lines don't use marketing speak. I'm a marketer now. I used to be a BDR. One of the worst things you could do is use marketing speak in your subject line. Like if I'm selling IT software and I'm like, uh, website reliability in you, I would totally be pissed and be like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Uh, right? I, like that sucks. That's a marketing subject line. Instead, I might say something like, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and then talk about how you saw that this person had been at the company for four years and they're managing millions of queries per second on their web traffic. That's pretty cool. That's a way more exciting thing that's about them as opposed to you. And lastly, a good subject line should be something you'd want to receive in your inbox. It's a good litmus test. Ask yourself if you got this email, would you open it? I don't know about you, Rishi, my inbox sucks. It's like a complete dumpster fire right now. Yeah, you don't open any of my emails. It's worse. All right. So this is a good one. Tactic number 11, don't be a creep. Line up your value prop based on your research. So one of the things that I see a lot of people do is they they like are creepy. Like you'll say like, hey, blah, blah, I noticed you use X technology. Or I saw that you, uh, I, I saw you use X technology or I researched something. If you're going to be a creep about something and mention, mention where you saw it, at least that could be really useful, especially if you go after marketers and stuff. But what's better is to just say a lot of value prop. So if I saw, for example, that Rishi, people that use Lead IQ that use LinkedIn Sales Navigator are slam dunk prospects for us. If I went and wrote an email and said, I saw you use LinkedIn Sales Navigator based on some data I might have got from HG Data or a data provider or maybe us even or something, it's kind of creepy. But instead, what you can do is just make your value prop coincidentally line up with the pain point that you think they might have. Like I might say, we think it's a huge pain for you to take leads from LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get them, to, get them into Salesforce. Lead IQ makes that really easy. If I go and say that value prop, it's going to line up more than me wasting space in my email saying, I see you use LinkedIn Sales Navigator. I don't know why I turn into like the ghost of John Lennon when I do that. But <laughs> I'm a beetle. <laughs> um, but that happens. Another thing, tact so tip number 12, don't do fake personalization. This ticks me off all the time. Anyone that's a manager in this call probably gets these messages all the time. Hey, Ryan, I noticed we had some shared connections. I'm looking to grow my network of professionals. I'd love to connect. It's, it's so easy for them to say something else. You could be specific when you do your re reach out and g connect better with your personalization that you're trying to do. So what I would do is talk about what you found when you're researching your prospect. It's pretty easy. That's tip number 13 on this. So like if I saw that you had worked at Oracle before or Salesforce, or maybe you were a manager at a company that I use that product of now, or you know someone that knows my dad, I might bring that stuff up. Just say that in your connection message. And you're way more likely to get a connection request when you actually that gets accepted on stuff. There's a best practice a lot of people say now of look, just just don't say, don't say anything. Um don't just send a connection request with no personalized message. I'm actually against that because you missed the chance to make a really good first impression with the prospect that you're going after. And I've had a lot of success when I do my prospecting and stuff on the side here at Lead IQ of doing that. I basically just bring up the personalization. Good example for me. Actually, I think I have one here. Um, By the way, Ralph is asking if there's a PDF on this that he can get later. Hell yeah, Ralph. You're going to get a PDF and it's going to be glorious. Um, so if you want to just bug me on LinkedIn after I'll send it to you. Otherwise, if you aren't, if you haven't added me on LinkedIn, I'm sure David and the guys at 10 bound will email something out to everyone as well. So, uh, tactic 14, some of the easiest ways to get your reps in the habit of saying these things is start your sentences like this. I saw you read your post about noticed you talked to Sarah a few months ago. I heard you. I don't, 
obviously make sure you really have a Sarah and they really talk to them, but I was using that as an example. Specific name told me X about you. Prospecting is really not, it's all about context. It, whether it's an inbound lead or an outbound lead, you need context. And if you're doing research on a prospect and you think they're a good prospect, you need to prove that context in the first sentence of whatever you're sending. If you're doing something over cold calling, it's the same thing. If I opened up a cold call with you, Rishi, and said, hey, Rishi, could I talk to you about how you're getting your leads into your CRM and if you're looking to get contact data? Mm -hmm. how would, what would you do? Would you be like, I got to get off this call, right? Yeah, 100%. I don't even want to be on this call right now. I know. I, like, we're paying <laughs> you to be on this call. You literally don't even want to be on it, you jerk. Um, but if I, if I go and called Rishi and said, hey, Rishi, I saw you posted a video on LinkedIn last week about how you guys are hiring reps and you have a really fun team. Seems like a cool company to work with. How's that, for, how's that phone call going to go? Uh, let's talk. Well, you wouldn't just say that. Let's talk. I no, just say, let's talk. Then, then I'd switch to the reason for my call is I know you're hiring a lot. You probably are trying to increase your deal sizes and get bigger deals in the pipeline. We might be able to help. And you're like, whoa, cool. The conversation will go a lot better. Yeah. By the way, Winnie uh, wanted to point out for personalization, any ideas for prospects that aren't very social? Oh, yeah. So one of the things that I recommend, this is kind of a weird thing, but just hear me out for a second. When I was a prospector at Dine, my response rates were somewhere between 20 to 30% of my cold emails. And I was ma mainly reaching out to IT people. So these are people that are like, shh, like hissing at light and don't want to talk to strangers, especially sales reps with stupid haircuts like me. What you do instead, and this is kind of what I would do, I would fall back on the company. So many reps today will talk about what happens in the company. If you go to a profile and you're just drawing a blank and can't find any way to connect, I would totally, totally fall back on company news. There's usually going to be a press release. There'll be something about hiring. Go look at a job posting of that company. Go look for people that they might be hiring. Uh, one easy tip that you can do, I'm probably spoiling a tip that I'm going to do later on, so maybe you're going to hear this twice. Don't hate me. But like, if I go to a company and I see that they're hiring uh, system admins and I sell the system admins, I might say, hey, blah, blah, I'm shooting you an email. I saw you guys are hiring a system admins, not a recruiter. I actually sell the system admins. I have a huge network of them. Send me a job post a link and I'll send them to you. And you can get the referral bonus when you refer them to your boss. Boom. They get really excited and they'll always respond to that. Because most of these companies have referral programs. So tactic 15 here, though, when you do personalization is you want to be detailed. That means that you want to actually go through. I don't have a lot of time to go through all these. That's why I'm flying through these, by the way. You want to be detailed with your personalization. Um, so when you send LinkedIn connection request, like this is what it feels like sometimes when I get these things. Like they use this old English term of like, shall do you accept thy LinkedIn connection request? Um, you don't want to pitch your LinkedIn connection request. That's tactic number 16. The reason is because it's a bad first impression. It sets you off on the wrong foot. And you'd be surprised how many people will try and pitch me on a LinkedIn connection request. They probably have it as part of their sequence or cadence. Yeah. So this is something that happened. Blah, blah, blah. I blurred out their info, obviously. I ran across your profile and company. I wanted to reach out to you and, so, and connect. It looks like there are some synergies between our two companies, a 35-year-old affinity marketing company that specialize in acquisition, retention, inception programs, and loyalty programs. This person's pitching me on their first on their first LinkedIn connection request. Instead, tactic 17 is reference something personal about the person or how you found them, like we brought up earlier. So for example, James Vitale, if you happen to be watching this, what up, dude, giving you a free plug, did not get permission to use this. James wrote this to me. Ryan, <laughs> what's up, dude? Saw your post just now flaming someone on their connection request and got a good chuckle out of it. P.S. You're super cool. Let's connect. I wasn't flaming someone. I was being nice. I'm never mean to people, I promise, on social. But I basically did a best practice po post about this specific tip, and James happened to see it and posted and mentioned that. If you're going after marketers, that's like key gold there, especially for them, because they have to put stuff out there. What's happening right now in business is your personal life and your professional life, especially with COVID, are kind of merging into one thing together right now. And that means that executives at these companies are being asked to put stuff more on social media today. There's got to be a better way. You're no longer in a room with a bunch of people talking to them. So these people are building brands online and talking about stuff. Marketing, sales, revenue, finance. Those are kind of categories you'll see a lot of people now posting things out there. HR. You start going to IT and stuff, they might be a little bit more shy, but you'll see CTOs and CIOs participating. Bring those things up. Bring up company things that are happening. Tactic number 18. Use another channel first when you get accepted on LinkedIn to pitch. So for us, if, I, if you add me on LinkedIn... I'm not going to write you an email or I'm not going to write you a message on LinkedIn right away pitching you. Instead, I'm going to use that trigger of you adding me on LinkedIn and make that my cold call. And I lead and say, hey, blah, blah, you just added me on LinkedIn. Or if, if I, I, you just accepted my invite on LinkedIn. It's because when you're on LinkedIn, you expect people to pitch you right away on LinkedIn. When you're on your phone and your email, 
the prospect's already trained to think that they're going to get prospected over a phone and email. It already happens these days. So that's kind of a good way to think about that. Tactic number 19, you want to make your first touch your best one. And then you want to hype whatever you did with your follow-up. So there's all these studies. You've probably seen that curve where like your chance of response starts high, then it gets low. And then when you get back to touch nine to 15, it goes back up. Generally speaking, you could make most of your touches and connections with your first touch. And we're going to talk about this stuff later on with how to make a good touch and actually have it be quality. But your first touch should be the thing that you're doing. It should be the beans. It should be the the, the golden ticket. I don't know why people would say the beans, but Rishi, how are we doing on questions? Do people have questions and stuff? So no questions, but Josh had a pretty good uh, roast. He also likes Bieber after the haircut joke. Which oh, oh, pretty good. okay. And right. Tom just said, great tip. Having said that, I think you could be a great infomercial host. You thought about it? Do you think so? I could, I could, I could be selling something right now. I guess you, you remind me of a sham walk. Yeah, that's right. I like that you moved your chair in the background and terrified everyone in this meeting. I'm really sorry you all had to go through that. Huge apologies. Rishi, you're a disgrace. I can't wait to fire you after this meeting. <laughs> Just, <laughs> all right. Uh, this is a tip I'm stealing from John Barrows. Uh, we've done a bunch of stuff with those guys before. Tech number 20, when you leave a voicemail, say your name last when you leave a voicemail. Um, I'm going to steal John's joke too. But one of the things that he says is that if you leave a voicemail, and you screw up, you can hang up and they don't know who you are if you screwed up and said the wrong thing. I think that's always really funny. The reason behind this logic is that when someone leaves a voicemail, you're usually using a transcription service that will transcribe your voicemail and email it to the person. So when they're reading your voicemail, they're not listening. Maybe they're in the bathroom and don't want to be a creep reading it, listening to a voicemail whether they're in a stall or something. Maybe they're uh, at, at home on their computer in a meeting and they're, they're kind of sneak reading emails and stuff. If you, one of the first things they're going to do is if they see your name at the beginning, they're going to have this pattern of understanding that. The one question everyone's always asking when they listen to a voicemail is, who the hell's calling me? Who is this? And they're probably not going to have your number saved because it's a cold outreach that you're doing. So leave your voicemail afterward. Leave your name at the end. That's the question they're always asking. So if I were leaving you a voicemail, Rishi, it's actually a super hard habit to do. But I might be like, I might be like, hey, Rishi, I was looking on LinkedIn and saw that you guys – are blogging and we sell blog software that makes it easier for you to have an SEO and stuff. I actually think that this post you wrote right here was really good. If I change these things, this X, Y, Z, that would be a big impact on it. This is Ryan from blogsoftware.com. Uh, we should talk. What are your thoughts on talking? I'll shoot you an email also after this. It's going to be the best email you ever read. And Hung then I'll up. respond to him saying, Hey, I have my boss's credit card. Let's do this. <laughs> Wait, you have my credit card? Yeah, of course. Uh Oh, Let's keep going, shall we? We're flying through these. <laughs> Tactic number 21, talk about what you did in an email or a voicemail during your follow-up. This is so easy that people don't do. I get it all the time. I'll have someone that sends me a great Vidyard video or or whatever software that kids are using these days. They'll go send me some like video that's really customized and great and I like it and it feels good. And then email two, call two, email four, call four. There's this whole macho sales philosophy that you don't want to bring up failure when you prospect. You don't have to bring up failure. You could just say, hey, I sent you a video last week. Not sure if you saw it, but I made an ass of myself. Wh whatever you do in that video, because we told you to make your first touch, your best touch, bring up the thing. Resummarize what they missed out on that first touch that you did. If you're leaving a voicemail, resummarize the thing that they missed out. For example, I once left a voicemail to, uh, I was actually prospecting exec vision. Uh, you guys know Steve Richard. I don't know if you know him, but we were prospecting him. And I told Steve Richard that I had the straight to DVD version of his haircut. He didn't respond. I called Steve Richard and said, Hey, I sent you a video last week. I was asking what kind of shampoo you're using. Did you watch it? And he'll be like, what the hell are you talking about? What the hell? What? No, I didn't even see that. I'm like, Oh, you should go check it out. It's pretty cool. We talked for a couple minutes, get off the phone. He checks the video. He calls, he writes back and says, ha ha ha. Right. I've got rapport and I've got a relationship building. Now that I have that relationship building with these people, when they actually are on the call and going through discovery, they're going to reveal way more pain with me because my relationship's better with them because I stopped and went out of my way to actually do something. If you have a better relationship right out of the gate on that stuff, uh, they're going to reveal more pain. They're going to be more likely to close. If they're not going to close, they're not going to ghost you. They're going to be like, dude, I can't do this right now. I'm sorry. They'll be honest with you about this stuff. If they do close though, your CS team will thank you later because they will reveal more pain as they're going through stuff and not be just jerks that are quiet and unhappy and do passive aggressive things. It's all about relationship building. I know like people like read the challenger sale and say, nah, you gotta do this other stuff. But like you can still sneak in relationship building with these things. 
Uh, so this is one that I love to tell people to do. You want to be yourself. Tactic number 22. This is the most important thing in sales today. You want to know what's going to beat the machine so that Pinocchio is not writing emails for you? It's you being yourself and having your own personality with the stuff that you do. A cold email that I write should be very different than a cold email that Rishi writes. And your reps should be doing the same thing. No one here grew up and said, boy, I can't wait to work in sales. You kind of just accidentally fall into it. And it's awesome. Like, it's great that people are doing sales and stuff, but you have these unique backgrounds. I did a call with some of the guys uh, at Rev.com, a service that we love that does transcription and stuff. I was talking to the SDR team there. One of the guys in the call was on the Philadelphia Eagles for two years. How freaking cool is that? He was on the he was on the staff there when they went to the Super Bowl. Like, I can talk to him about that stuff. He can bring that stuff up when he writes cold emails if he sees someone's an NFL fan or something. You all have different things that you can do here. For me, for example, I like to make movies. Literally, that camera in this picture is a, a video that I use that I po post my videos on LinkedIn on. Uh, I like to play piano. To the right of me is actually a piano. You can actually see a guitar back here. I'll sometimes make songs and send them to prospects. I put myself into my prospecting. I, I did that once and it booked 40%, which is crazy. Like I booked 40% of the people I emailed into meetings. Uh, I own a moped and apparently I'm not a good driver because that's me and a bunch of weeds and I had a ton of ticks on me afterward. But if I see, so, if I, I'll, I'll mention that sometimes. I'll make fun of myself when I write a cold email. I have two dogs. This is, uh, I actually have three now, but when I uh, put the slide together, I only had two. Fitting it on the left, Ruby on the right. They're really cute. They're little pups. And and I bring them up all the time. When I write cold emails and stuff, if I see someone has a dog, sometimes I'll bring that stuff up. If they don't have a dog, I'm like, hey, this is my dog Finnegan. He uh, thinks your company's really cool. I asked him. Sometimes I'll throw him in a video that I'm making, prospecting, all that stuff. And of course, let's not forget America's Treasure. I'm a huge fan of the actor Bill Paxton. May he rest in peace. Bill Paxton's an underrated rate actor, right? Everybody loves him. Twister, Titanic. I don't care if you don't know who Bill Paxton is. You need to go watch Bill, Bill Paxton movies. He's awesome. I might bring up Bill Paxton in an email. I've written emails where I name drop Gary Busey for some reason. And I'll get responses from people because of it, because I'm expressing things that are into me. Your reps have their own interests. They need to put that stuff into their prospecting, because if they do that, they'll be more passionate about the work that they do. How are we doing on questions, Rishi? Anything? Uh, no questions. A lot of LOLs. Oh, good. I thank you guys. I appreciate the LOLs, the lols, as the kids call it. Uh, tactic number 23, you want to put yourself in your prospect and find common ground. So one of the easiest ways to break in and actually make it, whoa, the slide just completely freaked out. Did you see that? Yeah. That's crazy. Sabrina's back. She got a cameo. <laughs> Sabrina took over. <laughs> this was happening. That's terrifying, isn't it? Um, all right. So what you want to do here when you're putting, finding common ground is you want to focus on your on your prospect uh, and their interest in stuff too. I don't necessarily mean like I saw you went to Oregon, go ducks. Like you can do better than that. Look at their LinkedIn social activity. If you find them on Twitter, see things that they tweet, look at accounts that they follow. Sometimes you'll see some prospects that follow some pretty sketchy accounts, by the way. It's kind of weird. Don't bring that stuff up. I'd avoid politics. I'd avoid religion. But if you have common ground, you have something that you can get along with someone with. Like Rishi and I both are big fans of Conan O'Brien. We yak all the time on Slack about like, well, we share Conan clips almost like every day, right, Rishi? Every day. If I were prospecting you and I saw that you once shared a Conan clip, I'm way more likely to do this. My, I had a rep on my team, J Drew Healy, that worked at Lead IQ, who saw that some guy was a big MMA fan and he liked the uh, MMA fighter, Leota Machida. And there's a famous gif that went around the internet of Leota Machida crane kicking someone in the face. I think it was Randy Couture. Drew literally wrote an email to someone saying, hey, blah, blah, this is what we do for prospecting. The guy wrote back and said, how did you know I liked Leota Machida? And he didn't say like, oh, I'm a creep. I saw that you liked Leota Machida. That's not what he did. Instead, he just said, oh, I, I like Leota Machida too. That's why I brought it up. I was oh, hoping you'd talk about it. Minutes to go. What'd you say? We have six minutes left. I know. We're flying through it, dude. This is easy. So uh, here's an example of how I've done it. So I had a video that I did. Uh, this is Finnegan, my Corgi. I wrote this to Sendergen. Hey, man, I'm really tight with the guys at Vidyar, and Sheikha told me you guys had a Corgi at the Revenue Summit. I actually have two Corgis at home. One Scarlet. She's actually passed away since then. This is really sad. Uh-oh, it's getting dark. Um, we rescued her in South Carolina. Before her, we have a Corgi named Finnegan. This is a video I made of Finnegan being super cute. He's the best. And it's just Finnegan running across the field in slow motion with sure it's a fire play. I love that you guys brought a Corgi to the conference. I actually wanted to see if you guys want to check out prospect, what uh, check out the prospecting tool we're working on. This is early Lead IQ many years ago. Don't judge. But you get the idea. That's how you transition and talk about this stuff. Tactic number 24, director level or below, focus on the prospect's own interest versus the company's. If we had more time, 
Uh, we can try this really quick. People in chat, if you're ready, I'm going to ask you this. How often do you think people stay at jobs? Just type in chat or something if you have a guess. Ooh, ooh, two years, two years, some, years, some, months, wow! Months. Look at these, look at these guesses poured in. Look at this uh, interact. Look at this interaction. Look at what I've created here. Um, so the average person, at least in tech and software and stuff, uh, they work at a job for eighteen months. So that means the first six months at a company, they're new, they're excited, they're 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 feeling great, they're learning stuff, they're trying to figure everything out. The next six months, they're trying to change stuff at the company. They have a lot of power. They're figuring things out, especially in the leadership level. In the last six months, they have a foot out the door. They're they're literally getting out of work and be like, why am I working here? This is terrible. They're staring down, waiting for 5 p.m. to hit on their clock every day. If you prospect people trying to just talk about them and their company with your value proposition, you're going to end up hitting some gutters with your sales and stuff because it they might not care about their job and they might not even care about their company. But if you tie stuff to be individually motivated for someone, my general rule of thumb is director or below, focus on them. If it's above director, you can VP level or higher, focus on the company because they're usually in, in it for the long haul. Whew. We're flying through these, aren't we, Rishi? Yeah, <laughs> we're going right through. Tactic number 25. This is so huge and no one does this and it makes me want to weep. When you're asking for a referral, ask for a specific person. This is the like, hey, Rishi, do you know anyone that could use Weed IQ? Yeah, of course. Who? My friend, Bob. No, no, Bob's made up. You don't know anyone that could use Lead IQ. <laughs> the point is, if you can go on LinkedIn Sales Navigator, click on someone's connections and see who they're connected with and ask for a specific name. Hey, blah, blah, blah. I saw you know Rishi's friend, Bob. Hey, Rishi, I know you I know you know Bob. <laughs> Bob you I'll come back. <laughs> I, you were a happy customer. We just closed you. Can you help me with this? Is there any way that you can help me get in with Bob? That's a way better conversation than... Hey, Bob, I'm cold calling you. Just curious if you know anyone that could use Lead IQ. You're destined to fail if you do that. There's actually a study that was done by the Send Rap uh, warm up guys that that uh, conducted this. It converts way higher. Tactic number 26. This one we're probably gonna you're gonna have questions about. It's crazy, but when you're measuring your reps, pro uh, I made this thing up that we use at the company called Prospecting Efficiency Score, and the idea is that because your reps represent your brand, you don't want them to just blast hundreds of people every day. So this is the two ratios that you can look at. You want to take the number of responses divided by the number of touches. That's your response rate. You want to take the number of opportunities divided by the number of responses. That's your qualification rate. Anyone that knows math knows that you can just cancel out those two things. Take the number of opportunities you have divided by the number of touches your rep do, reps do. And that's your PES score, your PES, your prospecting efficiency score. The reason you want to look at this number is you can use this to diagnose where a rep's struggling with. Maybe your reps are really good at getting responses, but they're really bad at qualifying. If that happens, you spend time on with them on objection handling and teaching them that stuff. If if they if that's not an issue for them, uh, then they're then you focus on the response rate. If both those numbers are pretty high, you what you do there's no like default number because every company has different goals and different quotas. Look at your best reps and see what they're getting and try and get your reps to get to that same PES. Here's the cool part: if they're struggling in both areas, it might mean they're not doing enough activity. And if that happens, you got to coach them on productivity and time management and things along those lines. So, tactic number 27, lead every touch with why the prospect is special to you. It's not about my product is helpful. It can save you time. It's not about my product will help you with ROI or increase revenue or any of that junk. What it's really about is you're an important prospect to me. I'm using this cold email to prove that to you. When I'm cold calling you, I'm going to cold call with a headphone on. I feel really stupid. But when I cold call you, the reason I'm cold calling you is because you're important to me because of X, Y, Z. And that's where the personalization comes in. You're not proving that your product's right for them. You're proving that they're important to you. Because even if your product's not right, you can keep the relationship open to, so that when the product is right, they'll be ready. And you know what happens? They respond and they end up looking at your product anyway. So uh, I actually wanted to show this as an example here. You can do this on all three things. It doesn't matter if you're doing email, LinkedIn, or, or phone. You still want to do that. All right. Now, tactic number 28, and then we're going to kind of wrap up and we'll do the other 30 at the booth if you want to come to our booth and check it out. You want to prospect your LinkedIn engagements. So what this means is when you get someone that engages or touches your LinkedIn stuff, you can actually click on their likes. Go call these people. It's easy. Post content every week. We'll go into some of this stuff at the booth too. You can actually grab them and go prospect them. That's a good prospect list. Hey, Morgan liked my post. Let's go after Morgan. 
Hey, Morgan, I saw you liked my video on LinkedIn sharing interesting content you, uh, you make during your off hours. I really liked the post you had about finishing podcasts. I still make it about them and what's special about them. I don't just talk about myself. That's what it's about, driving home that they're special to you and using the engagement as a trigger to break in. And here's the easiest way to get more discovery opened up and get more people to respond. You got to ask open-ended questions. That's one of the easiest things that you can do. We are at time. So I'm going to continue at prospect at tactic number 30 at our booth. So if you want to come to the lead IQ booth, I've got another 31 of these, or 30, I guess 30 technically, of these things <laughs> ready to go. So um, thank you everyone for listening. If you're not going to go to our booth because you think I'm a soulless, sad person, you can uh, just add me on LinkedIn. But thank you. We'll see. Hopefully you come to the booth. Bye. I won't forget you guys. By the way, Robbie asked for question number 25. You can start off with. Doesn't that break the creepy rule though? Uh, I'll have to see what what he's talking about. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll talk we'll talk about that after. Thank you. Bye.